Hi, I want to let everyone know that Anne will not be with us tonight, which is why Kim is standing in for her. Welcome, Kim, and thank you. Anne developed a very serious case of meningitis, and after seven days in the hospital, she is now in rehab for two more weeks of antibiotic treatments. I love you, and we all miss you. See you next show. Hi, I'm Kim. I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Keith Ghostland, and this is All Things LGBTQ. We are taping on Tuesday, May 4th. And as we have acknowledged in the past, we film this show at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. And now that interloper, Kim, is going to share some information with you. Hi. Uh, the LGBTQ protesters are voguing through the streets of a massive, in a, during a massive strike in Colombia. Eurovision's Vassal Gervomliev is ready to be a voice for LGBTQ people in North Macedonia and the Balkans. The Canadian National Railway, or CN, is withholding pension from a gay widower over the outdated def definition of a spouse. A verdict is due soon in the killing of gay rights activists in Bangladesh who were hacked to death in their apartment five years ago. Same-sex marriage bill has been passed, first reading in the Chamber of Deputies in the Czech Republic. And coming up on May 8th, it's Asexual Visibility Day. Okay. That's my stories That's I'm going to be reading lines, today. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Well, first, I, I'd like to tell our audience um, a very sad event in that Madeline Davis died at 80, a trailblazing lesbian activist historian. Um, she was a founding member of the first gay liberation organization in Western New York, the Mattachine Society of Niagara Frontier. She delivered a speech at the first gay march in Albany, New York in 1971, and she taught the first class on lesbianism in the nation at the University of Buffalo. She was the author of the groundbreaking novel, Boots of Leather, Slippers of Gold. Um, and uh, Anne's going to do a kind of an expose on her um, uh, next time she's here. And um, she's going to be interviewing, interviewing a curator, Dan Delano, Delandro, and he's agreed to give her a tour of the Madeline Davis LGBTQ archives of Western New York as a memorial to Madeline Davis. So, and the music industry leaders asked Tennessee lawmakers to stop disastrous anti-LGBTQ legislation. Protest to a homophobic sign in Appleton, <coughs> Wisconsin. Rainbows filled the streets and honks from passing cars rang out as members and allies of the LGBT community gathered in downtown Appleton. Uh, T2 Incomplete is a lesbian disabled love story that has lessons for Hollywood. Writer and director Suzanne Gauchi discovers the breakthrough representation and casting for her new film, which even has a blind cat. T2 Incomplete refers to a paralegic patient whose spine is severed but still has some feelings in her legs. CDC reports that four out of 10 trans women in major cities are found to be HIV positive. Little Shop uh, is out as a movie with trans and gay leads, and they win a prize at the Artos Awards. Uh, Dominique Lucius, a black trans woman, was killed in Missouri. Corey Mulligan stars in Saturday Night Live um, uh, sad flirting period drama. And I'm just going to stop here, and um, I have more headlines, but I'll do them later. But here's a clip from Saturday Night Live, which is really funny. So. <laughs> Featuring a 
Academy Award winning Lamb's choreography. And the Best Supporting Actress nominee, The Wind. And the one actual lesbian actress as Stone Cold X. Excuse me. Oh yeah, we were together for two years. <laughs> but the sex was so bad we broke up even though there's not another lesbian. Thank you. You've been staying up late again. <laughs> That was past your bedtime. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, May <clears throat> is Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. <clears throat> so, this week's trivia question. Who might have been the first LGBTQ plus Asian Pacific Islander in the U.S. Congress? And for bonus points... Who was the first LGBTQ plus Asian Pacific Islander in the Vermont legislature? Answers forthcoming. So first I want to talk a little bit about Massachusetts, <coughs> and the first is a sad. And it's acknowledging the death of Rajera de Alto, who was a transgender activist who lived in Dorchester. She and Another person who was staying in her household were fatally stabbed over this past weekend, and details are just starting to come out. And in fact, the police have not even confirmed the names of the people who had died. However, the alleged perpetrator was the husband of the other person who was in the household to whom Wahara was offering sanctuary. So there will be more to follow up. Uh, Bay Windows, remember them? LGBTQ plus newspaper in Boston. First, first edition was February of 1980. If you're looking for a new career, Bay Windows and South End News are up for sale. Oh. The current owner said the local news has changed, but its importance to our community has not. They've run their course. Time for someone else to take it over. And they've made suggestions that this might be a public digital media, media <clears throat> merger. Online, print, YouTube, or maybe a total nonprofit ownership. But they're ready. To, if you're ready, they're ready to know. hand it over to you. Also looking in Massachusetts, Holyoke, the first LGBTQ plus specific group home for people dealing with addictions. Isn't Holyoke where they voted down that gay guy? Was that Holyoke? Remember mm. he ran for mayor? No. I, well, I don't remember. Yeah, okay. That doesn't ring a bell. The only problem, though, they only have 16 beds. Mm. Oh, wow. So, and this is with, and the name of the organization is Mental Health Associates. So that's who a referral would go through. Rhode Island now by regulation from their Department of Health, you can amend your birth certificate to align with your gender identity, mm -hmm. and it's an F, M, or X option. Mm. So, and again, this was not by statute. The Department of Health did this on its own. And in Maine, Newcastle, a new sort of nonprofit foundation purchased the family farm that had belonged to Francis Perkins. Oh. And Francis Perkins was the first labor secretary under FDR. She was the first woman to serve at a cabinet level. She is the person who is responsible for the social reforms and the creation of the social security system. Mm -hmm. And she did a lot of work relative to improving the quality of your life. Minimum wage was one of her, her big. But nice. what's unique is that this new foundation that purchased the homestead, they're highlighting her longtime relationship with Mary Harriman Rumsey, who was her constant companion in Washington, D.C., until Mary died in 1934. And Francis indeed was married. So you're going to be able to visit. Yes. Good. But they are they are not <clears throat> hiding her right. same sex relationship. Mm -hmm. They are highlighting. Good. Which is a big change. Good. 
So, nice. so back to you, and you're going to give me all kinds of depressing news. All kinds of um, international news. Although the idea of a title that says LGBTQ protesters vogue through the streets <laughs> is just <laughs> lovely. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, it's, it's because they're having to protest. There were some protests going on over tax issues, and during these tax reform uh, protests, LGBTQ people led sizable contingents through the streets nationwide. Video reportedly recorded in Bogota and posted to multiple social media sites shows queer activists voguing their way to justice as part of a national strike yesterday uh, that shut the country down. Trans women dancing in a plaza were met by police with riot shields in one video. LGBTQ people, and especially trans women, have faced outsized levels of violence recently, recently in Colombia. A human rights report last year found hundreds of violent crimes against LGBTQ people in Colombia, including 63 murders in the first part of 2020 alone. 17 of those victims were identified as transgender women. Marriage equality has been legal in the country since 2016, and courts have protected transgender people's rights to correct their gender markers on their official identification, but violence is continuing as it is unfortunately in every country that I know of. Um, also, uh, Eurovision, uh, this national, this national European-wide contest where people uh, stand up from each country and do a song that they have written. Mm. Um, this very famous singer, Vassil Garvanliev, he is ready to be a voice for the LGBTQ people in North Macedonia and the Balkans. He and his family actually left Macedonia when he was young. He was singing, and they came to the States. Just as he was about to enter college, the, um, they were expelled from the U.S. They ended up in Canada. He's lived in several places, and he was out in all these places. And then he decided to move home and realized he couldn't even be out in his own language he, because in his native language, you can't just say, I have a crush on someone, or I love, I, I'm in love. You have to say, I love a boy, I love a girl. So he, had to, he, he didn't want to straightjacket himself, so he decided to come out. And his song that he has written is going to be, it's an outwardly you know, love song mm. to his partner. He says, my gut said this is the right moment to share everything about myself, to literally break down all my walls and to give you me as I am, which happens to be the most uninteresting thing about me, the fact that I'm gay. <laughs> so that was a really great story. Um, I have a couple others. Shall yeah. I continue those two? Yeah. Um, so the Canadian National Railway, known as CN in this article, is withholding the pe a pension from a gay widower over the outdated definition of a spouse. Um, Ken Hare was devastated when his partner of 33 years, Gary Schwartz, died in 2012. He was even more distraught when he learned he wouldn't see a dollar of the survivor benefits built into Schwartz's pension because CN Rail's plan did not recognize same-sex relationships at the time of Schwartz's retirement. Mm. Hare has spent parts of the last nine years fighting to get CN's pension and benefits department to overturn his decision. Now at 71 years old, he has taken the fight public. He would be devastated if he knew what was going on now, Hare said of his late partner. He was a company man. He loved CN Rail. Gary Schwartz, uh, oh, and then I am going to read a quote from the picture that I don't have. Uh, Gary Schwartz and his partner lived together in Toronto before moving to Harbor Grace to be closer to their family. Um, CN states, we realize that some former practices and decisions made in good faith in the past need to be reexamined in light of our engagement towards diversity and inclusion. Uh, there was a video of Ken's story on cbc.ca website, so if you're yeah. interested in more of that, take a look there. Um, and a verdict is due soon in the killing of gay rights activists in Bangladesh who were hacked to death in their apartment five years ago. Uh, Bainar News journalist Karen Rina Chowdhury Dhaka reported on April 27th that a verdict is due soon in this, this case. Um, when these two activists were killed, the work that they had done advocating for sexual minorities all but perished with them, according to fellow campaigners. The social movement to establish the rights of the LGBTQ people in Bangladesh 
after uh, the Zula's Tonoi murder has almost gone. Many of the activists have either gone into hiding <coughs> or left the country. An activist who asked to be identified only as men told this to be in our news. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was among those who marked the fifth anniversary of the killing of U.S. government employee Zulaz Manon and theater artist Mahbub <coughs> Rabi Tonoi, who, which prosecutors say were motivated by their activism on behalf of LGBT, LGBTQ people. Zulaz worked as an embassy at, at the U.S. Embassy in Dhaka for nine years and later for the Bangladesh Office of the United States Agency for Internal Development. Um, police did charge eight suspects with the murder in 2019. The trial began in November of the following year. Um, four of the suspects are behind bars. The rest are fugitives. Uh, but a verdict was expected on April, that was expected on April 6th got postponed due to lockdown and COVID. So uh, they're hoping certainly for a good outcome. I think it's clear from the news article that they obviously will be charged with these murders. The problem is that when asked if they could help protect people who are advocating for LGBTQ rights, the government said they couldn't um, because our penal code penalizes homosexuality, homosexuality. It's a punishable offense, so unless the law is changed, the government can't promote the rights of homosexuality in Bangladesh. Um, so that was you know, both a good thing that they're going to be dealing with this issue, but a bad thing that you know, you, there isn't a support right now. The penal codes have not been changed. I was going to say, you have to wonder what there will ultimately be for a verdict if the underlying basis for the action is these were, these were gay men and the action in which they were engaging was illegal, was illegal. in itself. Yeah. How, how is the court going to react to yeah. that? Certainly a brutal murder is a brutal murder. It's going to be punished, but um, it's not... Yeah. really dealing with the subtlety of the issue. We'll be coming back to that. Come back, yeah. So go ahead. Okay. Um, Anti-LGBT protesters march on a Florida school board member's homes. A group with hateful messages showed up at the house of Brevard County school board member Jennifer Jenkins. Uh, a supporter of her county's inclusive policy, policies. Her home in Satellite, her home was in Satellite Beach. A man speaking for the group of protesters said his name was Thomas Jefferson and the protesters were aligned with Jesus Christ. So. Broward County, Anita Bryant. Ugh. Yes. That's, that's where her campaign Ugh. against school teachers were, was based. In Bethel, Connecticut's coffee shops Pride flag was burned and dropped at the front door. This is not the first time rainbow flags have been targeted in this area 10 miles north of New York City. Montana advances re, uh, refusals. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Montana advances religious refusals in anti trans bills. I mean, they're happening all over the country. I can't report every single one of them because I'd be here all but day. But you can say there is a huge, there is a huge basket full of these. God, two hundred and seventy-three. <clears throat> I think they said something like thirty or forty states, at least, yeah. are mm -hmm. trying to pass so. these. Seattle police chief um, denies a dinner invitation sent by evangelist evangelical group known for anti-LGBT stance. It was billed as a law enforcement and appreciation event. This, is alleged, this event was allegedly hosted by Franklin Graham. <laughs> I don't think he can cook. <laughs> and on a sad note here, uh, police make an arrest of two North Carolina trans, uh, in uh, two North Carolina trans women's deaths. Their bodies were found in hotel rooms less than two weeks apart. Jada Peterson and Remy Fennell were both black and engaged in sex work. Two men have been arrested, um, but their names are not listed at this time. Why give them airtime? <laughs> Neurologist Olive Sachs, legendary, and final days are explored in his own life. He was 82 when he died. 
It was only two weeks before his death that his homosexuality was revealed publicly. The Rick Burns documentary premiered on April 19th, but you can see it on PBS American Masters series. Arizona just voted to ban queer history education. The bill would allow parents to opt their children out of education classes, which include LGBTQ history. I know. There's not going to be much left. I know. Um, it has taken 20 years to bring the story to the public of fashion designer and gay icon Halstead to life. He was a fixture at Studio 54. Halstead <clears throat> the series comes to Netflix on May 15th. You may want to see it. He died of age co AIDS complications in 1990. The movie takes place in the magical era of New York City, the time of Warhol and Steve Rebel, the owner of Studio 54. So that might be something else you'd like to catch. Um, and the question about Caitlyn Jenner says there's no biological boys who are trans should play on girls' teams. And someone in the article said, is she our new Tuxin, Tucker Carlson? Uh, so, yes, well, indeed, on. probably, huh? And a Jewish-affiliated Yeshiva University is sued after banding an LGBTQ club. The lawsuit follows multiple failed attempts to start an LGBT club at the New York City University. Students and alumni have filed a suit for denying them the right to form a student club. The denying the students club, they say, is violating the city's human rights laws. Natalia Smut, a trans woman and drag queen, was stabbed to death in Northern California. She was 24, and the man accused of her death was in a relationship with her. So. A Tennessee CEO is fired after mocking a teen boy who wore a dress to the prom. Sam Johnson of Visuel told the teen that he looked like an idiot. He was also really confrontational with this young person, um, you know, getting up in their face, and, you know, it was pretty the, the bad. The person who busted the CEO with what they did was Kathy Griffith. Yes, I yeah. saw she, that. She, she had a copy Kathy of... Kathy Griffith went up, put it online, and that's yeah. what happened. Yeah. 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 I Kathy. think she tried to intervene, too, but... Yeah. Garbage. On, this is interesting that an LGBT group, Asian group opposed Andrew Yang for New York City mayor. Yang met with the Stonewall Democrats of New York City to be interviewed. The group said that his answers were pandering and tone deaf. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. Young Catholics are deserting the church in droves to protest same-sex union bans. <laughs> that, yes. I was going to say that should have been one of Anne's stories. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And um, just as on my last story here, former Vice President Mike Pence launched a new advocacy group on Wednesday as he and other Trump officials look to boost their post-White House plans. Pence's White. Advancing American Freedom, which could serve as a springboard for his own presidential campaign, and will aim to promote the Trump administration's achievements and work as a counterpoint to the Biden agenda. <laughs> oh, God. oh, my God. I know. The new group is one of several launched in recent weeks by former aides of President Donald Trump. Shunned by corporate big money gigs, they are instead opening their own shops and embracing Trump's legacy as they speak to capitalize on his continued popularity in the Republican base. They include Trump's former senior policy advisor, Stephen Miller, German <laughs> fellow. Yeah. The, <laughs> the architect of polarizing immigration policies, who on Wednesday announced the creation of America First Legal, a group that Miller envisions as an American civil liberties union for conservatives. In a statement Trump lauded Miller and his group, the former president whose administration was bombarded with lawsuits said that conservatives badly need to catch up 
and turn the tables in court and that Miller's group would fill this critical void. So, I, I'm surprised you didn't choke on that story. I know. Uh, okay. I had to read it a few times so I could get it down. All righty. I think future shows, we're going to have to end it with everyone saying one positive LGBTQ plus story. I like it. I've got one. So that, <laughs> so that we... We're not ending with Steve Miller defending somebody else's rights. But indeed, on a positive note, Vermont. Vermont. Did you know that we have vaccinated more people per capita than any other state? I did hear that. Mm -hmm. If you're 16 or older, if you haven't, you can get vaccinated. Johnson & Johnson is a one and done. <laughs> one and, done. and there are sites showing up if you go on the Department of Health's website. And some of them, you don't need appointments. You can just I heard they're having a little more trouble in the Northeast Kingdom to get people to get vaccinated from that area. It's the, the, spread there, out. It's hard yeah. to get places. There are pockets. And that's why the Johnson & Johnson is, they're looking to... One who, shot and done. Who are, who, are the, who are the identified communities that we know that either you're not going to be able to or we're not going to be able to get back out? So. Yeah. I would think it would be really good for kids, too. You know, one shot, done. Well, right. And that's who it's being recommended for right now. Okay. So... People may have seen an article in seven days about the treatment of transgender people who are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And there were 15 people who have gone through the correction system who identified as transgender. All of them identified as being transgender women. What the, the article pointed out was the inconsistency in approach and treatment, that there were people who were being denied access to medical care to ongoing, you know, supportive medications or treatments that were needed for their affirmation process. So there are indeed already conversations happening within administration about this is not acceptable. I have some other questions, such as who's really monitoring this? When I looked at who are the advocacy groups and looking at our own communities, the people who have been the most active are the Women's Justice and Freedom Initiative, and that's not one of our community groups. Right. Where are we in this issue? You know, what are we doing to provide peer support to people who are incarcerated? And then here is my larger question. If this is how the incarcerated population is being treated, how is Corrections treating their non-binary and transgender identified employees? Because if you... Connected. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's this reciprocal... Because one of the things that you might advocate is that there be people who identify as transgender non-binary who are part of the Corrections employment system are there as a resource for the incarcerated population. Not that it's Not that the responsibility to, right. of one to take care of the other or to teach, but as a resource. Right. So, And they're seeing this behavior, if they're not out about who they are, only makes their work life more miserable. Yeah. Absolutely. Because they then are forced to deal with it. It's not okay. So let's talk about our legislature. Sure. So... People know that I have a passing interest in it. So some of the things that have actually passed is H-145, which is the use of force. However, in the final version that came over from the Senate, they had changed the, the absolute language that had been proposed by the House that a law enforcement officer could not use a chokehold. The Senate version said, gave an exemption, saying that if you were at the you know, lethal response level, that a chokehold was not an unauthorized means mm -hmm. by which for self-defense. I've got some questions, and I'm not sure quite how that happened, but both the House and the Senate 
agree to that language. So that's what's going to the governor for signature. The other bill that passed was H-128, which would allow a ban on the use of a trans or gay panic defense in a criminal defense here in Vermont. When it first was passed out of the House, it was a 146 to 1 vote. Wow. It pa- well, no, it passed out of the Senate 30 to 0 vote. Mm. The Senate made some adjustment. They cleaned up some language. They were really clear about not only could a trans or gay panic defense not being used in criminal prosecution, but you also couldn't take it into consideration in sentencing. So, Because during the sentencing phase, you can introduce information that may not have been introduced earlier. You can't do that. The House concurred unanimously with the Senate version. So Vermont is the first state to issue a ban on the use of trans gay panic defenses by unanimous vote. Mm -hmm. Governor has already said he is signing this, waiting for it to come to his desk. So a little overview. Our legislature thus far has passed 26 bills. They've gone both through the House and the Senate on their way to the governor. In the House, there were 452 bills introduced this session. In the Senate, there were 148. That's 600 bills. (laughs) What can you think of? Well, there's 150 members of the House, so that's at least two bills apiece. Oh, God. And there are 30 members of the Senate, so that's like five bills apiece. But but some of the things we're still watching. And Rainbow Umbrella is going to want to know about this one. H-177. It's up for its third reading tomorrow. This is the bill that would allow the change to the Montpelier City Charter for non-citizen voting. Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah. It passed on second reading in the Senate 21 to 9, mm. which was all of the Republicans and two of the two Democrats. So this is about to happen. Good. So the other things we're watching in the House S16, this is the bill that was dealing with inequities in discipline in Vermont public schools. Mm. And originally, as drafted, it only dealt with racial inequities. It has since been expanded to include both racial, ethnic, social, and disability. So we're all, I mean, finally, we're all in there. This actually may be up for a third vote tomorrow. Also looking at S-15, and this is in the House as well, as opposed to virtually you know, 49 other states, Vermont's one bill about voting is how do we deal with defective ballots? Such if someone happened to mail their absentee ballot back in and forgot to sign the envelope. A lot of that, people did that. There is a mechanism in place where the city clerk could reach out to the individual do it the second time. to correct it so your vote counts. Right. So our initiative was not to try and make it more difficult. Make it's it easier. if we recognize there's a problem, how can we reach out to you to get it corrected? I'm so pleased. That's good. The other in the Senate, and this, you know, in my conversation with Lieutenant Governor Gray today, this just passed. H-428, and what this does is that it amends the existing bias and hate crime statutes and removes the maliciously intended, because that created, well, that created a standard which made it virtually impossible to prosecute, because it goes to intent, it goes to motive. How, How do you determine that? Where do you get that information? And it makes a direct connection, though, that one's actions was based on the actual or perceived representation in a protected class. Right. So, but what it didn't do is there had been a provision in here that would have allowed or required data collection by the Office of the State's Attorneys and the Office of Attorney General on the use of bias and hate-motivated, you know, 
when was it attempted, did it succeed, what were the circumstances, whatever. And actually, one of the things that's come up repeatedly during this legislative session, and it was from the Agency of Education to the state's attorney to law enforcement, you know, to the Office of Attorney General, the Human Rights Commission, we don't collect a lot of data. We have enacted a lot of positive, inclusionary, intending on equity statutes, but we didn't build in a mechanism to gauge are they working, and if not, where are they not working, or put money or positions to associate with it. There is one bill that's been introduced, um, it was actually introduced by Brian China, that would add positions to the Human Rights Commission specifically to look at what needs to happen. And there is a data collection provision in it. And just really quickly, Human Rights Commission. This is where you would report if you knew of a public accommodation that was not in compliance with the gender neutral bathroom bill. Well, people had gone onto their site to try and report and it said complete form below. There There's was no, no form. They, they just had a vendor redo their website. So now they're going through and, and looking at, okay, what didn't come over that shouldn't have. So as of this afternoon, you can report, you can report it, it has been corrected. Good. It was one simple request to them saying, uh, and they were like, cool. within 15 minutes, they had fixed it. I think the wayside, at least they used to, but I haven't been there in a year. But they had, but they had um, single-use bathrooms, male, female, mm -hmm. men, women. That's, that's not okay. <coughs> One of the things where some of the public accommodations Maybe. get confused if it was a traditional male bathroom and it had a urinal, they're like, oh, well, that's still a male bathroom. No, the caveat is it's single-use, one person at a time. Right. You can use whatever fixture you matter. want, yeah. and you can lock the door, right. and that's the provision. Yeah. The other bill that the Senate passed out of the Senate Judiciary on a 5-0 to zero vote, H-183, this is about sexual violence and consent. And there was a lot of controversy once it got over to the Senate because the Senate was saying the House really didn't fully vet this, and what people brought up, there's a lot in here that talks about what doesn't constitute consent, such as you're intoxicated, unresponsive, whatever. But it never defines what does what constitute cons consent. So it was like, we may want. So they actually use language from Oklahoma, hmm. which apparently has some of the better language in the country, so that it's clearly defined this is what needs to happen for consent to have been given. Makes yeah. me want to sing. Oh, yeah. Oklahoma. <laughs> oh, Oklahoma. The, the other bill we're, we're really looking at closely is H210. And this has passed both the House and the Senate, but it looks as though it's going to a conference committee. The House hasn't concurred with the Senate yet. This is equity in the health care system. And again, this is one of the bills that Brian China mm -hmm. may have been part of. And it, it would create the Office of Health Equity. It would establish a health equity advisory council. There would be money for giving grants to promote health equity. Good. Data collection, bingo. Bingo. And this is the part that I really liked. If your license or certification requires a continuing ed component, you have to have at least two hours in cultural competency. Good. Good. So that's an ongoing. And the other bill that I had actually talked with Brian China about on our latest um, interview show is H273. And this is a racial and social equity bill. But what this does, and the narrative along with this, looks like somebody master's level dissertation about inequity with 
in relationship to land access and property ownership. And one of the companion pieces of this was the initiative by the Racial, Alliance, Racial Justice Alliance to try and get each township to designate a parcel of land for BIPOC ownership. So. Nice. So we've we've got a couple of minutes. Yeah, I've got. <coughs> you have a couple of things. I have a couple of things. Me too. You go. I also wanted to say, and I know that she's not uh, LGBTQ, but I heard on the news today that Stacey Abrams mm -hmm. was writing romance novels. Intriguing. Check that out at uh, a really? local bookstore. Under a pseudonym. <clears throat> Stacey Abrams. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, you've so, got to pay the rent somehow. Yeah. All right. I'll, yeah, absolutely. So there was one international story that I hadn't quite gotten to, which was the um, same-sex marriage bill passes its first reading in the Chamber of Deputies in the Czech Republic. Uh, the bill that would legalize same-sex marriage in the Czech Republic passed its first reading uh, a couple of days ago, and it will now be scrutinized by parliamentary committees. Um, interestingly enough, a separate motion to define marriage as between a man and a woman also advanced. It really gave me deja vu to hear that. Um, during the debate, SPD leader Tomio Okamura said he would rather jump out of a window than be adopted by a same-sex couple. <laughs> Okay, it was nice what? telling you. Yeah, yeah. Since, Carry two, on. Adios. since 2006, the Czech Republic has allowed registered partnerships for same-sex couples, um, which grant several rights of marriage, including inheritance and hospital visitation rights, but not joint adoption, spouse's pension, or joint property rights. Mm. I know, well, it's killing me. <laughs> this thing is hot or something. Sorry, my microphone. If you um, turn your microphone over, people can't hear what you're saying. And then what I was saying was, um, <laughs> it's just, it's hot. Um, okay, so we won't do a whole lot on that, but it was interesting to hear this. And uh, the government commissioner for human rights uh, noted in, within the Czech Republic noted that the current system of registered partnerships discriminates against LGBT couples. We owe it to same-sex couples to settle their situation, she said. Um, and a colleague of hers agreed, marriage for everyone is the solution. Everyone should have this right. Um, the other story I just wanted to touch base on uh, is that uh, coming up on May 8th, it is Asexual Visibility Day. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar with it, asexuality exists on a spectrum. It's a term used to describe people for whom uh, sexual attraction may not exist at all, or sometimes maybe on a, on a lower spectrum. Um, and, and there can be varying levels of asexual, of sexual, romantic, or emotional attraction for aces, asexuals. Um, and there, there was some interesting information online. So May 8th has been Asexuality Visibility Day for a while, but there was some concern over how that day was initiated through uh, some sort of pop song that dealt with... Um, like using decks from a card, you know, card decks with for the aces, and they felt like the the reference to the song and the date was just not really positive. And so recently, it's been moved to April sixth. So mm. either way, April sixth was or April eighth is uh, Asexual Visibility Day, and I think it, it's also a clear indication that within the queer community, we are we're always also negotiating and debating what our realities are and how really current we are on whether we're being open enough and inclusive enough in mm -hmm. what's going on. Because so. I was just thinking about like, I was thinking, well, how many famous people or people that are in the news or politics or anything ever talk about this? Or whether they are or they aren't. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, it doesn't seem to be, you know, a term that Asexuality? That the people Ace. feel comfortable. Yeah, it's a tougher sell. And about. a lot of times people are asked time and time and time again, well, uh, what is it we can do to fix this for you? Maybe you haven't read the right person. Maybe there's something wrong yeah. with you. You know, people will spend a good portion of their lives looking for hormone treatments or something because they think there's something wrong with them. And they're, they're not broken. It's just, it's just who they are. Yeah, they're asexual. Well, I was going to say, going back to the Victorian era, 
yeah. what we uh, lovingly refer to as a Boston marriage, right. which was this intimate, emotional, mutually supportive, but totally non-physical, non-sexual relationship. Right. But people acknowledge the level of commitment between the two individuals. Yes, because everything is not about sex, right? And when you talked it's about not? consent, oh, for some people, okay. uh, when you talked about <laughs> consent earlier, yeah. we would be helped by including all of us, whether it's an LGBTQ community or anywhere, the viewpoints of asexual people, because consent is so much more complex than yes, no, now, then, whatever. It's just, and what, how we, communicate as human beings. There's companion love. There's just wanting to have somebody to put their arm around you, which yeah. people can relate to now that COVID has hit, yeah. right? Yeah. Just getting a hug, right? Yeah. Or you're so just these things are connected. Night, just cuddling. Or, yeah. yeah. So these are all connected, I yeah. think. So what you got? It was, I think that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see more people come out. Yeah, well, I will tell you. Famous Here, let me, be, let me be like the first international whatever beyond the people in my personal life yeah. that know that I identify as a bisexual grace, which means I'm a gray ace, which, which look it up. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I, and, and it's, it's hard to explain bisexuality to people, let alone to then go, what? And now you're asexual? What is that? So it, people don't come out about it because it's confusing. And you, yeah, it's you just don't want to have to advocate. Also like if you say, well, I'm just not interested in sex. They, they're, they're like, like yeah, what? they're like, what? I'm like, chocolate is way better than sex. <laughs> wow. So anyway. I After just, you. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one story that I'd like to, um, and it's about the Tennessee. It's, it takes place in Tennessee, and it's the music industry. Um, and they want to stop the disastrous anti-LGBTQ legislature. Leading record labels, streaming services, and publishing companies in Nashville issued an open letter urging lawmakers to denounce legislation targeting the LGBT community. Last month, Governor Bill Lee signed a bill requiring trans students in Tennessee <clears throat> that they couldn't compete in, they could only compete in sports according to their gender at birth. You know, I'm like, well, you know, the, the part it's the that, new demon. You know, <laughs> it's the new demon. It's the new demon. Because they can't do gay people anymore because nobody cares. Right. You know, so. Well, one of the things we need to be looking at with some of these pieces of legislation is that some of them require a genital examination. That is abominable. Yes. Before you it can. It is unacceptable. Oh. That is abuse. So, going on to our trivia question. Yes. Yes. So, May. Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. First, Asian L Asian Pacific Islander LGBTQ plus U.S. Congressperson might have been Mark Takano, Mark Takano, who was elected in 2012. That's not that long ago. Not still there. From, no, he's still he's still serving. Oh, okay. He's been reelected. If, if he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, right. which means every two, two years he has to run again. Yeah. Is it um, two years? Yeah. Oh, that's for the cool. House. The Senate's every six. Yeah. But what's unique about Mark is he identifies as Japanese Sansai. And the Sansai is an acknowledgement that his grandparents were in a war relocation camp during World War II which means they lived in California and they were sent to one of the internment camps in the desert in Arizona, which is a piece of our history that we really don't talk about. Yeah. He's now actually, by the new Democratic majority in the House, he's the chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee. So, nice. So Vermont, first Asian Pacific Islander LGBTQ plus legislator. It's a trick question. Because? We haven't had one. <laughs> we haven't had one. I was going to say. Oops. We Oops. need one. So with that, Linda. Well, what do we usually do? We resist.